أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت فارجع البصر هل ترى من فطور ثم ارجع البصر كرتين ينقلب إليك البصر خاسئا ينقلب إليك البصر خاسئا وهو حسيب ولقد زينا السماء الدنيا بمصابيح بمصابيح وجعلناها رجوما للشياطين وأعتدنا لهم عذاب السعيد الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين إن شاء الله today we're starting with سورة الملك which is surah number 67 and this is the beginning of the 29th juz as well um, just a little bit of a note and a, a little bit of a notice a heads up um, inshallah these sessions that we'll be conducting are also being recorded uh, to be put online and to be podcasted out um, so because of that for the brothers and sisters that are, are going to be listening to this online or are going to be downloading this and listening to this these sessions are not being conducted in a closed room, in a studio where I'm sitting by myself giving these sessions. They're being done at a live location with brothers and sisters in attendance. So if there's ever any type of an interruption or there's any background noise or anything like that, it's because it's being conducted live. And that we feel that adds to the quality of the sessions and the material that is being conducted live. Uh, secondly, with the brothers and sisters who are here in attendance in person, um, alhamdulillah, I've been conducting the tafsir classes here for a few years now, for a while. And so alhamdulillah, normally in the sessions, it's a very casual, very informal uh, arrangement. And what that means is that whenever anybody has a question or any type of a comment, they interject their question or comment and it turns into a little discussion as well sometimes. Just because this material is being recorded for the benefit of a lot of other people, um, I'm humbly going to request that as much as possible, um, unless it's absolutely necessary at that moment, but as much as possible, if you have any questions, please hold on to them, write them down, or anything like that. And rather than interspersing the questions throughout the session, I'll save time towards the end where we can thoroughly do a proper Q&A, and we can answer any and all questions, inshallah, that are there about the session. So now talking about the 29th juz. Before we get into the surah, I want to kind of do an overview of the portion of the Qur'an that we are studying now. The 29th juz, the beginning, Suratul Mulk, from here begins the last and final group of surahs. Basically, this is the seventh and last group of surahs, thematically speaking. That if you categorize the surahs or you bunch or group the surahs together based on the theme and the concepts, then this is the seventh and the final, the last group of those surahs. Begins with Surah Al-Mulk, goes all the way till the end of Surah Al-Nas. And these surahs overwhelmingly focus on talking about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and focusing very heavily on da'wah, spreading the message, delivering the message of Islam, sharing this um, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the message, the divine message being sent by Allah to share it with the rest of humanity. And it focuses on sharing this message and spreading the da'wah by concentrating on speaking of the greatness of Allah. 
So there's very vivid language. It's very descriptive of the elements of nature and what you see all around you. Trying to make the human being understand that look around you, all this that you witness around, all the systems that, that are going on and uh, concurrently moving about smoothlessly, flawlessly, this should all lead you back to, this should all point you in the direction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, recognizing Him and devoting and dedicating yourself to Him. It also, this, this portion or this portion, these group of surahs, they also very heavily focus on speaking about the life of the hereafter. It talks about death, it talks about what will come after death, the fact that there is an afterlife, that there is a life after the passing away in this world that people experience, and what will occur in the day of judgment, and what will be the conditions on the day of judgment. It very heavily focuses on this. Um, the unseen matters of faith the very essentials of believing, and especially the issues that people normally have. First of all, recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most natural form of introducing somebody to Allah, the most natural form of conveying the message of Islam to someone, and making them understand that Allah is one alone and worthy of being worshipped. Um, introducing Islam to someone is by just letting them soak in what's going on all around them. It's the most natural form. And it's how, it's how the Qur'an introduces us to iman. It's how we even teach our children iman. How we are able to teach our children the, the necessity of believing in Allah. And similarly, this should also be a very focal point of our da'wah as well. Just telling people to just reflect on their lives. Just take a look, stop for a moment, and just kind of look around you and see what you see going on. And then ponder on that for a minute, and see if it doesn't lead you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's what the overwhelming portion or the group of surahs is going to talk about. Now speaking more directly about the 29th juz itself, then that of course similarly focuses on the da'wah. The 29th juz is overwhelmingly makki. Um, and so meaning that it is, this revelation took place during the period in Mecca. So it doesn't, really, it doesn't have a lot to do with specific injunctions, giving you ahkam, telling you, you know, pray this much and you pray zakat this much and things like that. It doesn't really address those things. It addresses more of the core concepts of faith, the accountability, consequences of actions, life after death, these very fundamental concepts that are necessary to faith, to belief, to iman. The first of these surahs is Surah Al-Mulk. Surah Al-Mulk is a very, very comprehensive, very thorough, and a very strong surah in its tone. Very strong surah in its tone. By the tone of the surah, and also based on the narrations and what the scholars have told us, and the narrations that we have about Surah Al-Mulk, it's very obvious that Surah Al-Mulk was sent down, was revealed during the early part of the mission of the Prophet ﷺ, the early days of Islam, the early Meccan period. Why very specifically? Because the very early part of the da'wah focused on what we call in Arabic, indhar, indhar, which means to warn. The very early part of the da'wah focused on warning people, like a wake-up call basically. We, we misunderstand that sometimes, not scaring people, but a wake-up call. Like, wake up, realize what's going on. Snap out of it. Time, you, you know, you don't have forever. You need to realize what direction you're going in and what direction you need to be going. That type of a wake-up call. That was the tone of the early part of the da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ. As we see in the Qur'an itself, when the Prophet ﷺ came home and was wrapped up in his shawl, Allah addressed him and said, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, qum, stand up, fa'anthir. And warn people. Wake up call. Then what did Allah say? وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ And proclaim the greatness only of your master, only of your Lord. I'll talk about that in a second, but remember that, hold on to that. The other thing is, even later on when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave specific instructions to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on how to go about in this wake-up call, this warning of the people, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell him in Surah Al-Shu'ara? وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ And warn, give a wake-up call, warn the closest of your tribe's people, your relatives, the people that are related to you. So your extended family, your relatives, the closest amongst them, gather them together and warn them, wake, give them that wake-up call. And that's when the Prophet ﷺ gathered them together and gave them that whole example. What if I told you there were people behind this mountain and you were about to be attacked? 
And so that was that wake up call. That was that warning message that listen, you don't have forever. And time is of the essence. And you guys are going in the wrong direction. And you, it's, it's of the utmost importance that you realize what direction you need to be going into and that you need a shift, that you need a turn. So Surah Al-Mulk is very strong in its tone. It's from the early part of the surah and so therefore it focuses on the warning. We're gonna see in this surah that there are almost six, after the introductory portion of the surah, where sort of the tone is set and the basic, the introduction is done, the basic message is presented. After that there are about six or seven ayat where Allah gives a very stern warning to people who make the wrong decision or are going down the wrong path or making the wrong choice. And then in only in one ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, well, what's awaiting the people who make the correct choice? So six or seven ayahs of warning, one of giving, congratulating them. And giving good news to the people who are making the right choice. Once again, why? Because the tone of this particular surah is to warn. So it's very strong in its tone. And it sets the tone for the rest of the surahs to come. So this is a little bit of the historical significance of the surah and sort of where it's based in within the life of the Prophet ﷺ. As I talked about, Surah Al-Mulk, aside from being very strong in its tone, Surah Al-Mulk, as I mentioned from Surah Al-Muddathir as well, when Allah gave the Prophet ﷺ instructions, He said, "Qum, stand up, fa'andir, warn the people, wa rabbaka fakabbir, and proclaim the greatness only of your master, only of your Lord." And I was talking about how the, the primary way of conveying the message to people, making people realize their obligation to Allah, is them simply taking a moment, stopping for a second, and just looking at what's going on around them, looking at their lives, looking at everything they benefit from. And so that's what this surah will focus on, making you understand the greatness of Allah by observing the majesty and the magnificence, the perfection of His creation that you see all around you. Look at the sky, look at the earth, look at everything He's created for you. Look at the perfect harmony, the consistency, the balance. And that will lead you to understanding how great and magnificent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. The other thing is that this surah very heavily focuses on teaching people to reflect. And this reflection once again upon the creation of Allah. So reflection is going to be a key point here. And we'll be talking about it in today's session inshaAllah. The next thing that is very interesting here in Surah Al-Mulk is that there's also kind of an underlying trend, a theme, or an emphasis on consistency. Consistency meaning that constantly you will see the consistency of Allah's creation. And so even the specific words within classical Arabic that are used here within the surah all kind of have this similar thread of consistency in the core meaning of the word. So that's another consistent theme throughout the surah that we're gonna see here. And the, net, the last thing that I wanna mention before we get into the actual study of the ayat and the words is that one thing that's very important and something we've always done in our classes here is looking at how one surah segues and transitions into the next and seeing the beauty of the composition of the Qur'an in the form that we have it. So the surah that comes before Surah Al-Mulk is Surah Al-Tahreem. Now we haven't done a study of that surah yet, but nevertheless, we can still appreciate the connection between these two surahs, Surah Al-Mulk and Surah Al-Tahreem, and how Surah Al-Tahreem very naturally transitions and segues into Surah Al-Mulk. So in the very beginning of Surah Al-Mulk, as we're gonna see here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in the second ayah, He says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا that Allah is the one who created death and life. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ So that He may test you, أَيُّكُمْ That which amongst you, whom amongst you, أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Would be the most excellent in deeds, the most excellent in action. So what Allah is saying here is that this whole system of death and life and living and dying that we see going on all around us, that we are a part of as well, that we are experiencing ourselves, the purpose behind all of this is to test who would have the most excellent deeds and the most excellent actions. So in the previous surah, in Surah Al-Tahreem, at the end of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala practically shows us two categories of people. And that's actually a very powerful message within, within Surah Al-Tahreem. Allah shares with us the two categories of people. Some people when they are tested, they pass the test. They excel 
in the test and they are able to come out on the other side a lot better than they came into the test. The people that Allah, the, the examples that Allah shares with us from that category are the wife of Fir'aun, Imra'at of Fir'aun. How she was very severely tested, but she came out better for it. And similarly, Allah shares with us the example of Maryam, the mother of Isa alayhi salam. How she was also very, very severely tested, but once again she came out better for it. She was consistent, she was able to work through it, and it worked out to her advantage. But on the other hand, you have another category of people who are also tested, but it doesn't always work out that way. They don't always come out better for it on the other end. The two examples that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares with us in Surah Al-Tahreem of that category of people is first of all the wife of Nuh. The wife of Nuh, the Prophet sallallahu salam. Nuh alayhi salam was a messenger of Allah. His wife who was tested once again, she had to pick a side, she had to place her loyalty somewhere and she placed it with the disbelieving people, even against her own husband. So how she came into a test, but it worked out badly for her. She was not able to excel in the test, she failed the test. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents the example of the wife of Lut alayhi salam, another messenger of Allah. She was also tested, but once again, placed her loyalties with, on the wrong side, and she came out worse for it. So this surah in the beginning talks, talks, tells us the, the fact that the purpose of this life and the system of life that we see in, the, in this world is basically to test who would have the most excellent deeds and actions. Let's go ahead inshallah get started with the very first ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكِ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ Tabaraka, the very first word, it comes from the root of the word baraka. It comes from the root of the word baraka. We know baraka means blessing. But the core of the word, the root, the origins of the word has two implications. Has two implications. One thing is, is aziyada, to increase. And the second thing is al-baqa, to be long-lasting or even everlasting. So to be enduring and increasing is the core of the meaning of this word barakah. And it's used in a lot of different contexts. There's many different usages for it in classical Arabic. For instance, in classical Arabic, when there would be a big pond of water. Not like a lake or a river or some huge body of water or a moving water. But there's a pond of water that's been sitting around for a very long time. Five, six, seven, eight, ten years, this pond of water has just been there. So the Arabs would call that birka, because that water has been there for so long. Sometimes an a, a, a camel, like a camel, if it becomes agitated, it sits down, very stubbornly it sits down. And it refuses to budge, it refuses to move. So the word that the uh, Arabs would use for that type of a sitting of the camel where it gets angry, it's agitated, is buruk al-ibl, or barak al-ba'ir. That the camel became agitated and the camel sat down and it's stubborn, it won't budge, it won't move, it's gonna sit there for a long time. So they would use this word baraka to elucidate that, to give that meaning. So from that we learn that baraka just, just, just does not mean blessing. It means blessings that are enduring, long lasting, and blessings that perpetually are increasing. Constantly they continue to increase, and they are also long lasting, enduring blessings. Now one thing the Qur'an tells us is that these, the source of these blessings is Allah Himself. And that's why it says tabaraka. Tabaraka is the exaggerated form of the word. It has mubalagha, hyperbole. So it means most blessed. The source of all blessing. Any blessing that you see around can be, is pointed back to, is attributed back to Allah Himself. And so this is expressed over and over again throughout the Qur'an. فَتَبَارَكَ Allah. Tabarak al-ladhi nazzal al-furqan, tabarak al-ladhi biyadihi al-mulk. This is constantly attributed back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So tabaraka means most blessed. Now the next thing Allah says is tabarak al-ladhi, most blessed is the one who. Al-ladhi means the one who. So it's not say, mentioning the name of Allah Himself. Rather it refers to Him, it alludes to Him. That most blessed is the one who. But other places in the Qur'an, we do see, sometimes it says, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ So sometimes it says directly that most blessed is Allah. Even in some prophetic supplications, we find the word, تَبَارَكْتَ Most blessed are you, O oh Allah. Directly addressing Him. Or the name of Allah, لَفْضُ الْجَلَالَةِ itself is mentioned, that Allah is most blessed. But here it doesn't do that. It says, most blessed is the one who. So 
the scholars even discuss to this extent, why is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not mentioned directly? What are the benefits of alluding to Him indirectly like this? Tabarak al most blessed is the one who. Well, there's a few different reasons. The first thing is that as I mentioned, the one very important message in the surah is reflection. And we'll see later on in this surah as well, in ayah number, in ayah number 10, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even tells us, وَقَالُوا That when speaking about the people that will be sent to the fire of hell, the people who made the wrong decision, the wrong choices, when they'll be sent to the hell fire, there they will say, وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُوا أَوْ نَعْقِلُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُوا أَوْ نَعْقِلُوا Which basically means, if we had listened, and we had pondered, we had thought about it. Only if we had listened, and we had thought about it. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them an opportunity to think about it. Because those people are basically now regretting if we would have just listened and then thought about it. So here Allah is giving them the opportunity. It's not being handed to them like just openly, Tabarak Allah. Rather they're being said, Tabarak Alladhi. Most blessed is the one who. So He gives them an opportunity. Who is it talking about? So that's the first thing, reflection. The next thing is if you read the next word, Allah says, Biyadihi al-mulk. Biyadihi al-mulk. Ba in the Arabic language means many many different things. It has like 12 different usages. Here it's ba dharfiya. It means like fi, in. In bi yadihi, in his hand. Al mulk. Al mulk in the Arabic language means like kingdom. The kingdom. The dominion it's often translated. It's kind of a complicated word, we really don't know. But like the kingship, the kingdom. And be kingdom al-mulk naturally encompasses and includes al-milk. Milk is one word, mulk is another word in Arabic. Mulk means kingdom. Milk means ownership. But mulk obviously means that you already have ownership. It naturally implies milk to have the ownership by being the king of something. So mulk is a very comprehensive word. So here Allah says, biyadihi al-mulk. In his hand is the kingdom. Now the other thing that you have to pay attention to here is sentence structure, word order. This is something I've talked about in previous tafsir classes we've had here as well. Like when we say, tawakkaltu ala Allah, or tawakkalna ala Allah. We put our trust, we put our reliance upon Allah. But when you switch the order, when you say, ala Allahi tawakkaltu, or ala Allahi tawakkalna. You see what I did? I just swapped it. Tawakkaltu ala Allah, or ala Allah tawakkaltu. Na'buduka, we worship you, or we enslave ourselves to you. But then when we say, Iyaka, na'budu. Only you do we enslave ourselves to, do we worship. So when you swap the order, when you flip-flop it, you basically create the meaning of exclusivity. Ikhtisas in Arabic it's called, exclusiveness. And you gotta understand what this is. This is called abnormal sentence structure. If somebody says something abnormally, What's the first thing that it, that it, if this is the, um, if, if this is the Islamic Association of Mid-Cities, and somebody says, and everybody knows that's the name of the organization, and somebody says Mid-Cities Islamic Association, doesn't it catch your attention? Like, wait a second, what did what, you say, brother? No, it's the Islam, and you correct him, or, or at least at the minimum, it catches your attention. To swip, swap the order, to say something in reverse, it catches your attention. That's the benefit of this. So two things, not only does it create the meaning of exclusivity, but it also catches the attention of the listener. Makes him say, wait, wait, wait a second. That sounded different. That's not how people normally say it. So normally it would be said, al-mulku biyadihi. The kingdom is in his hand. But now it's saying, biyadihi al-mulku. In his hand, meaning only in his hand is the kingdom. Only in his hand is the kingdom is the dominion. So what it does is creates a meaning of exclusivity and catches the attention of the listener. Because remember, I told you the focus of this surah is da'wah. This is from the early part of the da'wah, early part of the seerah, the beginning time of the period in Mecca. So what was very important here was to catch the attention of the listener. So you have these features within the language. This is, this is what's meant when we say that the Qur'an is a miracle. See how precise the word usage is? How precise the sentence structure is? It's serving the purpose of that time. 
catching the attention of the listener. So that's the thing. Now, the uh, like I was telling you before, why not say Tabarakallah? Why does it say Tabarakallah? Because it says biyadihi al-mulk. So most blessed is the one, only in his hand is the kingdom. You don't really have to say Allah at this point, do you? Who's the one? Only in his hand is the kingdom. There's only one answer to run correct answer to this question, and that is Allah. So it doesn't need to be said. So that's the thing. So number one, it doesn't need to be said because it's already mentioning something that is specific to Allah. Secondly, it's making the person think and ponder. So like I said, in ayah number 10, those people in Jahannam are gonna be complaining, crying, regretting, remorseful, saying only if we would have listened and we would have thought about it. Well, the, just the first four words of this surah are making them pay attention, are making them listen. Because the language that these people spoke, it's presenting an abnormal sentence structure. Biyadihi al-mulk. Only in his hand is the kingdom. And secondly, then it's making them think. Now who is the one in whose hand alone is the absolute kingdom? It makes them sit down and think for a while. And then they come to the natural conclusion that it is only Allah. So tabarak al-ladhi biyadihi al-mulk. Most blessed is the one in whose hand alone is the kingdom. Wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. Wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. Wa huwa and he, huwa means he, ala kulli shay'in qadir. Ala kulli shay'in means over each and every single thing. Qadir. Qadir. The word qadir comes from the root of the word qudra. Qudra means to have the ability or the capability to do something. To have power. Power over something, control over something, the ability, the capability to do. And but this word Qadir, Qadir, it means the one who has ability. Or the one who has power. The one who's capable. Qadir means the one who is constantly powerful. Constantly in a position of power, capability, authority, and the ability to exercise his power over each and every single thing. So that's what Qadir means. So once again, like I told you about biyadihi mulk same thing applies here. The normal sentence structure would be, وَهُوَ قَدِيرٌ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ But that's not what the ayah says. The ayah says, وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ Swift. It swapped the normal sentence structure. So once again, it's abnormal. When it becomes abnormal, the sentence structure, then once again, it creates a meaning of exclusivity. And only he is capable in control, in power over each and every single thing. Only he. He's the only one in this position. He's the only one in, who has that authority. وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ one interesting thing as a reflection on the ayah after we finish, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only said He has the kingdom, He has the ownership, or He's in the position of authority over each and every single, over, over everything. In His hand alone is the kingdom. Not only did Allah say that, but we've seen it in our time, just because somebody's in a position of authority, does that mean that they have an absolute control over each and every single thing that apparently falls under their jurisdiction? Not necessarily. There's a lot that goes on. So just because somebody's the king of an area, of a region, doesn't mean he has an absolute control and power over what everybody within his jurisdiction is doing. No, that doesn't, that's not necessarily true. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not that type of a king. Allah is such a king, not only does, is everything in his hand, the total kingdom, the total dominion, the total authority, but at the same time, he's in control over each and every single thing. That's the type of king Allah is. That's how much in control Allah is. So already the very first ayah of the surah is attributing not only the, Allah being the source of all blessing in our lives, around us, in the entire world, all blessings trace back to Allah, but it's also establishing the fact that He's the one who's in total ownership of everything, He's the king over everything, and He is in complete control over everything. It's very impressive the first ayah. It really makes the person sit down and think. It weighs very heavy on the mind of the person that this is who I'm dealing with. Now the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alladhi. So we're being told something else about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again. Alladhi. He is the one, خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاتَ Who created, He is the one, He created الْمَوْت Which we normally translate as death. But I want to explain this word to you. 
death doesn't exactly mean mot excuse me does not exactly mean death doesn't only mean death death is a part of the meaning and implication of the word mot but it does it's not the the overall meaning and the only meaning that can be taken from the word al mot mot has a broader application the next word is wal hayata hayat means life hayat means life mot is actually the antonym the opposite of life so it basically refers to lifelessness lifelessness so not necessarily death as we understand it because we understand death in a very specific context mot is not just death mot is lifelessness so that means before we were conceived and born into this world before being conceived and our ruh being put into the womb of our mothers the condition before that would also be defined as a type of mot it was we did not have life in this world so mot is a broader word than we understand it to be so that's the first thing so allah is the one who created mot and hayat lifelessness and life and even um in one tafsir a scholar he's actually put together um an observation from the quran different places in the quran where allah uses the word death in various meanings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah al-an'am Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says aw man kana maytan fa ahyinahu aw man kana maytan fa ahyinahu what that basically means is Allah is saying that well could it be the one who was lifeless fa ahyinahu and then we gave him life what this ayah is talking about this is talking about somebody who did not have iman and then Allah gave him hidayah Allah gave him iman. So he went from being a disbeliever to a believer. Allah describes the disbeliever as maytan. Now we would translate that as somebody somebody who's dead. The one who is dead and then we gave him light. But of course we know that that life, excuse me. We know that's talking about being dead from the heart, the iman. But that goes to show you that the word maut is not as simple as death as we understand it. Biological death. but it can be used in a broader sense so the spiritually not being alive not having iman allah uses the word maut or mayt to describe that person kuntum amwatan fa ahyakum in surah al-baqarah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says kuntum you were amwatan lifeless then he says fa ahyakum then he gave you life thumma yumitukum then he will give you lifelessness death again thumma yuhikum and then after that he will give you life So we see here again Allah is already talking about look you were lifeless he gave you life he'll give you death and then he'll give you life. So we know that the condition even before birth before life in this world Allah describes it as amwat maut dead. Yuhil arda ba'da mautiha. Allah speaks about in surah al-Hadid the earth after it, it hasn't gotten rain and it dries up and nothing can grow out of the earth again Allah uses uses the word maut to describe that condition of the earth that Allah will revive the earth after it has died so once again maut is being used in a different way about talking about the shuhada what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say amwatun ghayru ahya or rather excuse me um about the shuhada Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says bal ahya rather they are alive now biologically to us we know that they're not alive but still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to them as being alive even though biologically to us they've died Allah still says they are alive so there's a lot of there it's a very broad application of the word maut that's important to understand so here Allah says Allah is the one who he created maut lifelessness wal hayat and life why did he create the system liyabluwakum liyabluwakum this comes from the root of the word bala the lam in the beginning of it means because for the purpose of it's to show the purpose of yabluwakum yablu comes from the root of the word which means to test to test to try to test and what's interesting here is that in other places in the Quran Allah uses a more heavy a more heavy form of the word instead of bala Allah uses the word ibtila ibtila which means to very severely test very severely test like in the same juz we're going to study later on in surah al-insan surah uh, surah ad-dahr allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says nabatalihi 
Nabatalihi, that we tested the human being. We will test him. We will test this human being. Why does Allah use the lighter form of bala here and the heavier form of ibtila in other places? So when you take a closer look at it, what we understand is, if you look at the end of this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَهُوَ aziz al ghafur Ghafur. Allah being ghafur necessitates that He would very lightly test. A form of maghfirah, a form of forgiving someone is to lighten the load off of someone. And in that Surah Al-Insan where Allah says, we'll very harshly test him, what does Allah say? فَجَعَلْنَاهُ سَمِيعًا بَصِيرًا I gave him the ability to hear. I gave him the ability to see. Allah even goes on to say, إِنَّا هَدَيْنَاهُ sabil. We guided him to the path. So there Allah is mentioning His favors upon this human being. We gave him so many of these abilities. We, gave him, we basically served it to him on a silver platter. We're going to hold him accountable. We're going to test him. We're going to make sure he sticks to it. What we've told him to do. But here, Allah is mentioning the fact that look, Allah is ghafoor. So he uses a lighter word for testing. Literally meaning that Allah will lightly test. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ So going back to the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He's the one who created mawt, He's the one who created hayat, lifelessness in life, so that He may test you. Kum. Kum is the plural. All of you. I'm pointing this out because it's gonna be important in a second. What does Allah go on to say? Ayyukum. Who amongst all of you Ahsan wa amalan. Ahsan comes from the root of the word which means excellence. So who amongst all of you would be the most excellent? More excellent. Ahsan is the comparative form. More excellent amalan in his deeds, in his actions. So now what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said is, Allah is the one who created lifelessness and life so that He may test all of you to see who amongst all of you would be more excellent in his actions? Who would be more excellent in his deeds, in his actions? وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ And he is Al-Aziz. Izza. Izza from the root of it, it means to not just have power, but to be firm and to be in a position of authority and power. So Allah is Aziz. He is firm and he is powerful. Al Ghafur. This comes from the root of the word Ghafara. The root of the word Ghafara is very interesting. It literally means to cover up something. So forgiveness is called Ghafara because it's as if Allah covers the sin. Not only does He forgive you, but nobody will ever know about it. Nobody will ever see it. He hides it from everybody. So Ghafur is the one who constantly forgives. Constantly is, in, is forgiving people and has the authority to forgive, has the ability to forgive. So. Another very interesting, couple of interesting things in this ayah is based on what I explained about the meaning of the word mawt, people look at this ayah and it says, Allah خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاتَ Allah created death and life. Doesn't it seem more logical that life should be mentioned before death? At least you would think so. You would think it would be more logical. But why does Allah mention the other way around? One reason I've already told you. Because mawt doesn't just mean death, it actually means a state of lifelessness. So even before we were conceived in this world, that could be considered mot as well. So now it makes sense. The other thing is, who's Allah speaking to? Who's Allah addressing? People who are alive in the world right now, right? What's the next thing that we're gonna see right now in our life? Are we gonna first see life? Or first we're gonna experience death? We will experience death. And then we will have a life after that. So based on who it's talking to, people who are alive in this world right now, it's very logical. You will experience death next, and then after that you will experience life. And the third thing that's very important here, I mentioned that the theme of this surah is, one of the themes of this surah is to reflect. It makes you think, it makes you ponder, it makes you reflect. So the point of this ayah is to say, look, you better have good deeds, right? Ahsanu amalan. Excellent deeds, excellent actions. So it's trying to motivate you, it's trying to inspire you, it's trying to create a sense of urgency. What, what creates a sense of urgency in people more than death does? Death is the ultimate motivator. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, أَكْثِرُوا مِنْ ذِكْرِ هَادِمِ اللَّذَّاتِ He said very frequently, abundantly, remember 
that thing which destroys the the sweetness or the taste, the pleasure in things. Meaning when you be, fall into your indulgences, you become kind of, you start distant, becoming distant and floating off, being completely drowning into your desires. What snaps you out of that? What can break you out of that? Remembering that I have to go. So death is a motivator. Creates a sense of urgency. So Allah mentions that which motivates us first. Al-maut. Hey, you don't have a lot of time. You better get to it. There's no tomorrow. You can't put it off for tomorrow. It's got to happen now. It's got to happen here. Right now, right here, right now. The next thing I want to mention, then we have to inshallah go for the salah. I mentioned that here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِيَبْلُوَ kum, So that He may test all of you as a group. The reason why I emphasize that, that it's plural here, because in the coming ayat when we study inshallah next week, we'll see that Allah then switches to addressing us in the singular. But here is a, he's addressing us in the plural. What's the purpose of the plural? Because this condition of life and death, this equally applies to all of us. Every single person in this world will die. No exceptions. There's no exceptions to this. So it's something that's universally applied. Something that we all share as an experience. The other thing is, أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Who amongst all of you will have the more excellent actions? the more excellent deeds. It's creating a sense of competition. You know why? Because it's in our nature to compete with each other as it is. It's in our nature to compete with each other as it is. The Qur'an tells us, يَعْلَمُوا أَنَّمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا Know that the, this, the life of this world, no doubt, is what? لَعِبٌ وَلَهُنْ Play and wasting time, زِينَةٌ Vanity, beautification. And what does he say? زِينَةٌ وَتَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ Showing off with one another. وَتَكَاثِرُونَ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ Trying to gather and compete with each other in family and wealth. أَلْهَاكُمُ التَّكَاثُرُ Allah said, it's makes you useless this competing with each other. So competing with each other is human nature. Look all around you, you see it everywhere. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, look, that's a part of your innate, innate nature to compete with each other. Don't try to suppress that sense of competition, rather apply that positively. How do you apply that positively? فَاسْتَبِقُوا الْخَيْرَاتِ Compete with each other in doing good deeds. سَابِقُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ Try to race with one another to the forgiveness of Allah, and to Jannah and to Paradise. سَارِعُوا Rush, race with each other. وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ Let people compete with each other in that, in Jannah. So similarly here, Allah is saying, look, you have competition built into you. You want to apply that positively? Compete with one another. Allah is watching, Allah is looking, Allah is judging who amongst you will have the more excellent action. And the last thing here is Allah uses the word ahsan, which means excellence. Right? Allah does not use the word akthar. Allah uses a word that implies quality, not quantity. Quantity is not demanded of us, not asked of us, has no value on its own. Quantity is only significant after you have already applied quality. But quantity without quality is useless. So the word ahsan tells us that, look, get quality in your action. And that's something that's very important. For instance, right here, right now today, we sat down, everybody made time, came here, said we're gonna study Qur'an, came here, sat down for 45 minutes, and we studied how many ayat? Two ayahs. Now you could go home feeling, man, we only did two ayahs, what's this? <laughs> I'll die before we finish the Qur'an. Right? Or you can enjoy the fact that you understood it with quality. You thoroughly. Understanding two ayahs properly, ayatain, it's much, much better than if we would have read 20 ayat, but without quality. Praying two rakats with khushu of nafil is pray better than praying 20 rakats of nafil but up and down, up and down, up and down. So quality is always important, that's what's being emphasized. Inshallah, we'll go ahead and stop here for today. Oh, I didn't realize. Salah. Oh, subhanAllah. Okay, so I've been rushing. So we'll go ahead and, we'll go ahead and relax and we'll, inshallah, get some studying done. That's excellent. Okay. So, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ He is the one who created lifelessness and life. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ So that he may test all of you. Ayyukum, 
Who amongst you ahsanu amalan is more excellent in his action, has better quality in his action? Wa huwa al aziz, and he is al aziz and he is al ghafur. Even these two specific attributes of Allah that are mentioned are very precisely and very specifically mentioned. Al aziz implies the strength and the firmness of Allah, and ghafur implies or points to the forgiveness of Allah. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we, re- we just talked about the previous surah, talks about the outcome of this test. Some people fail the test, like the wife of Nuh and the wife of Lut, alayhim as And some people pass the test, like the wife of Fir'aun and Maryam, the mother of Isa, alayhi salam. So, the people who fail the test with them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, al-aziz, firm, strong, but the people who passed the test, even if they had a little discrepancy here and there, shortcomings a little bit here and there because of being human, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafoor with them. The other thing the scholars point out is al mawt wal hayat. Mawt, the quality, the attribute of Allah of being al aziz applies to mawt, death. Because death is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes life. Meaning when the time comes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're gone, you have to go. No matter what your situation is, what your circumstances, who you're leaving behind, how sad it is. You ever hear about the death of someone and it just made you sad? Sometimes somebody passes away and they're 87 years old and they saw their great-grandchildren and they lived a full life and that person passes away, you're still sad, but you at least acknowledge the sense they lived a full life. And then the 20-year-old passes away in a tragic car accident. The mother of two small children passes away. A small four-year-old dies. And it breaks your heart. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-aziz. It's being done for their benefit. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا How, why, when, where exactly, maybe we don't understand now. But Allah is al-aziz. He's firm. It's going to happen. It's going to pass. Because Allah has made that decision. And ghafoor because of hayat. Ghafoor in hayat. Meaning during this lifetime, we can constantly work towards the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We invoke the forgiveness and the mercy of Allah. The next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now, الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّبَعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ طِبَاقَ Now this is where the reflection continues. So I told you how the previous ayah teaches us to reflect. The first two ayat, it doesn't mention the name of Allah explicitly, rather it tells you He's the one, all the kingdom is in, is in his hand. He alone is in control over everything. So it makes you think. Reflection is beginning. خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ hayat. Reflection. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا You look around, you see where do you stand? Where do I stand? What is the quality of my actions and my deeds? So the reflection continues. Now, reflecting on that which is around us. First we've reflected on what we go through, what we experience ourselves. سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ One other place Allah mentions about they, they, we will show them our miraculous signs around them, outside, in the horizons, and then within them. Here we see that the person is first reflecting on himself. Life and death. There's something we're constantly experiencing. Somebody's near, dear to us is dying and passing. And children are being born every day. So first that reflection, now reflecting around us. الَّذِي خَلَقَ سَبَعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ طِبَاقًا that he is the one who created seven samawat, seven skies, or seven heavens, as we normally translate. A little bit about this word, samawat is the plural of the word sama. Sama'un literally in the Arabic language means anything that's above you. Anything that's above you. But then some places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala limits the word sama, Either by mentioning a number for it, like here's seven skies, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala limits it by mentioning a quality, an adjective for it. Like we're gonna see in ayah number five in Surah Al Mulk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wazayanna sama dunya, the sky of the world, a dunya. So sometimes Allah limits it, what he's talking about. So here it says Saba Samawat, the seven heavens, the seven skies, which of course is talked about all throughout the Quran and the Prophet has informed us about it as well. But then Allah mentions an attribute for these seven skies or these seven heavens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tibaqan. 
Now, tibaq in the Arabic language comes from the root of the word tabaqa, which means for something, two implications. Either for something to be one on top of another, one on top of another, or it also implies something being consistent. Like mutabaqa. Mutabaqa, almost like muwafaqa. Something being consistent, synchronized, consistent. Or it refers to something being in layers or stages, one on top of another. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He created the seven skies, either one on top of another, which is one obvious meaning, or it can also mean that He created seven skies consistently. There's a, there's a connection, there's continuity, there's consistency between them. A comparison or rather the opposite of this that we can observe within the Qur'an is when Allah speaks about the clouds, He says, فطر, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the clouds by describing the clouds as rukaman. Rukaman. Rukaman means like they're kind of one on top of each other but they're all scattered. Like you just randomly throw things together. And they kind of pile up on each other, but they're scattered. There's no consistency. There's no alignment. Tibaqan is not like that. Tibaqan is alignment. Consistent. One other discussion that the scholars have made here is, Samawat, it's a plural. The adjective could have also been in the feminine plural form like Samawat. It, should, it could have also been Tabaqat. Sabaa Samawatin Tabaqatin. But that's not how it's done here. It's tibaqan. Because tabaqat is a plural, but tibaqan is not only just a plural, but it's a bigger plural. Because it's talking about the seven heavens, which are humongous, which are enormous, which are huge. So the larger plural is used. Not only that, but this is also the, the root of the word, like the, 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 the idea behind the word. In Arabic, the, the, base, the base of the word, the ing version of the word, which is like the idea behind the word, like we say running, or education, or to eat, ing, or to eat by adding to, or education, like an idea. So that's the base of the word in Arabic. The base here is also the word tibaq. So not only is this the base of the word, but it's also the larger plural, so it's more appropriate to use this here. So Allah says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ سَبَعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ طِبَاقًا Allah is the one who created the seven skies with consistency, in layers, and consistently with each other. Another thing the scholars mention about the consistency, we understand how they're in layers. So the, you have the first sky or the first heaven, and then the second one and third one, one on top of each other. That's fine. But even consistency, because Allah tells us in the Qur'an, look at the consistency of the heavens and the skies. Allah tells us, وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِيدِ مُسْتَقَرِّ لَهَا The sun, Surah Yasin, Allah tells us, the sun, what does it do? It moves along a very fixed path that's been assigned to it. وَالْقَمْرَ قَدَّرْنَاهُ مَنَازِلَ حَتَّى عَادَكَ الْعُرُجُونِ الْقَدِيمِ Allah says that the moon, we fix stages for it till it returns back to, like into that crescent form, the little thin line. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the orbiting of the planets, the solar system, the galaxy, Everything's moving around. But look how perfectly everything's moving around. Nothing collides with each other. Everything is moving smoothly, going about. Everything is fixed. Look at the perfection, the flawlessness of Allah's system. Not only that, but the scientists tell us that the amount of moving things that are out there in space, and the sheer amount of the objects that are large enough, powerful enough, moving fast enough, so that if they would collide with the earth, everything on this earth would be destroyed. Meteors and asteroids and planets and stars, it's un comets, it's unbelievable. The amount of things that are moving out there and how fast they're moving and quickly they're moving and the amount of them, but yet, what happened? Nothing. Nothing comes crashing into the earth. Nothing destroys us as we know it. This is a perfection of Allah's system. See how smooth it is, how protected it is, how flawless it is? Tibaqan. مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقِ الرَّحْمَنِ Now here, this is what I was talking about. Allah says, you will not see في خلق الرحمن in the creation of الرحمن meaning in His creation, what He's created, you will not see in what He has created مِن تَفَاوُتٍ Any, the word min here means any, تَفَاوُت means inconsistency. 
inconsistency, like major inconsistencies. You won't find any type of inconsistency, like a lack of synchronization, any differences, any misalignment, inconsistencies you won't find. And the other word, think about the word tafawut is, the word tafawut in the Arabic language, in classical Arabic, has a very negative connotation. Even the other forms of the word. Like if you say, فاتك الأمر, it means you missed out. You missed out. So if there's a sale going on and it said, فاتك, you missed it. Meaning you missed out on it, it's not coming back. Too bad, you, lose, you lost out. Tough luck. So it's a, it's a very negative word. Tafawut means any type. It's, it's once again with hyperbole, with mubalagha, exaggerated. Any type, even the smallest bit of inconsistency, you will not see it anywhere. Min, anywhere in that which Ar-Rahman has created. Now a few things to focus on here in just this phrase, Allah, this part of the ayah, Allah says, مَا تَرَى This is the singular. Meaning he's saying, you will not see, but he's saying it in the singular. Remember in the previous ayah, I pointed out, لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ Transition from plural to singular, why? Once again, the previous ayah was talking about something that applies to all of us. Death and life. So we all share that experience, that, go, that applies equally to everybody. Everyone's gotta die and everyone will be brought back to life. Regardless of who you are and what your situation is. The other thing is, it was creating a sense of that competition there. Compete with each other in the excellence of your deeds. So it was collective. Here it's talking about reflection. Right? That's what it's saying, right? Meaning you won't see in the creation of Allah, in that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, Ar-Rahman has created, you won't see any inconsistency. Meaning you sit down and look at it. Ponder on it. Reflect on it. Reflection is a personal thing. Reflection is not a collective thing. It's a personal thing. Somebody's more amazed by sitting out at night and looking at the stars. But somebody's equally amazed at just by sitting there and looking at a tree. And somebody's more amazed by going to the zoo and looking at the animals. Seeing this is Allah's creation as well. Somebody's more amazed when they look out at the ocean and they see the waves crashing. There's something different that inspires different people. So it's a personal thing. So Allah makes it, speaks to us in the singular. I mean, go out there, sit down for a while, quietly, and reflect, ponder, think about it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is Allah, in the first part of the ayah, Allah says, He's the one who created the seven heavens in layers, in stages, with consistency. Then He says, مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقِ Rahman, But you won't find in anything that Allah has created. Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, you won't find in that, in the creation of the skies, any inconsistency. But He says, anything that Allah has created. He generalized it. He broadened the scope of this statement. You know, this is something very interesting. The obvious reason is that, not, if Allah would have said, you won't find in the creation of the skies any inconsistency, somebody could make the argument, okay, there's no inconsistency in the sky, but inconsistency in the earth, or in the mountains, or in animals, or in people. No, no, no. But he said, anything Allah has created, you won't find inconsistency. Aside from that, this is broadening the scope of it to make a connection between ayah number three and ayah number two. Ayah number two talked about what? Life and death. The human experience. Ayah number three is talking about the sky. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly throughout the Qur'an, time and time again, place and place again, Allah draws an analogy, a comparison, a parallel between the life of people, the human experience, the phases of life, and the sky. There's a connection there. He always draws that parallel. In Surah Al-Inshiqaq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, فَلَا أُقُسِمُ بِالشَّفَقْ He swears by the changing of the color in the horizons at the time of sunset. وَاللَّيْلِ وَمَا وَسَقْ And when the darkness starts to kind of spread. وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَسَقْ And when the full moon comes out. You see how it progressed? First the sun sets and the color starts to change in the horizon. You see the red and the orange and the colors. Then the darkness starts to creep out and spread. And then eventually you see the moon fully risen. All you can see is the moon out there. Allah says this, you see the phases of the night, what you observe in the sky. What does He say after that? لَتَرْكَبُنَّ طَبَقًا عَنْ طَبَقًا You will experience life in different stages. 
in different phases. So just like this, you see the sky in the horizon, it went from red, orange, to started to get dark, and eventually it's full black and the moon is out. Similarly, through life you will go through phases. Difficulty and ease, or childhood, and then adult, and then becoming old, and then dying. Similarly here, that same analogy, that same parallel is being drawn. خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ hayat. You have the different phases of life, you were not in existence, then Allah gave you life, then you will die again, then He'll give you life again. كُنْتُمْ أَمْوَاتًا فَحْيَاكُمْ ثُمَّ يُمِيتُكُمْ ثُمَّ يُحِكُمْ And then here, He talks about the sky being consistent, being in layers, being in stages. So just like the sky has stages, your life has stages. You were conceived in the womb of the mother, then you were given birth, you were a helpless baby, then you started to walk on your own, childhood, then you came into adulthood, maturity, puberty, adolescence, and then you started to become intelligent, then you got married, and you were independent, then you had your own children, then you became old and feeble and weak, and then eventually you died. Just like life has its phases and stages, the sky has phases and stages. And just like the stages of the skies are all synchronized, they're all consistent, the phases of life are consistent. And the other thing is, like I talked about, the stability of what we see in the sky. Everything's moving around, but yet we're safe. Everything's okay, everything continues on its pattern. Life goes on. Life continues on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's so much, aside from what we experience, there's so much Allah protects us from in our day-to-day lives. We just don't realize it. I mean, it's not hard to understand. You know, if somebody from 500 years ago, was to see us the way we drive around on the streets, they'd be terrified. I mean, if you sit down and think about it for a while, human beings moving around at the speeds of 70 miles per hour, zooming past each other. Allah protects us. Air travel. I I think about it every weekend when I board the plane, I think about what an unnatural experience. That I'm about to travel 800 miles in the next three hours. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us. So there's so much that He protects us from in our lives. مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقِ الرحمن. And the next thing the scholars point out is, once again, why not say مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقِ اللَّهِ You will not see in the, that which Allah has created, but rather that which Ar-Rahman has created. Why use the specific attribute of Ar-Rahman? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is letting us know who created all of this for us. Allah did. He is Ar-Rahman. He's so abundantly merciful. He's created all of this for you. He's given everything that you have. It's to create a sense of obligation to Him. You know like if, if your uncle is asking a favor of you, and he's telling you to do something for him, and you maybe he's doubtful if you will do it or not, how does he make you feel a sense of obligation? I'm your uncle. I'm asking you as your uncle. That's your father. To create that, like, like, how are you gonna say no? You're gonna say no to your uncle? You're gonna say no to your father? To create that sense of obligation. Same thing, Allah is ar-Rahman. Once again, that, that pondering, that reflection is continuing. You're really gonna deny Him? Ar-Rahman? You're not gonna believe in Him? You're gonna refuse Him? He's ar-Rahman, He's given you everything that you have. So then Allah says, فَرْجِعِ basar. فَرْجِعِ basar. So then what? Irji'ah. Arji'ah, excuse me. So then what? Arji'ah. Arji'ah means return. Take back to its original position. Meaning, Arji'ah means to return. So if I pick this bottle of water, this bottle of water is sitting here. And I move it. Arji'atuhu. Arji'uhu. I will return it back to its original position. That's what it means. It doesn't just mean to return something. It means to return it back to its original position. Place it back exactly where it was before. So, فَرْجِعِ basara. Basar normally we translate it as vision. But it just doesn't mean vision. It's the amr from bab if'al. Irja. Right. If'al. So, basar doesn't just mean vision or sight. It means vision and sight, which incorporates mental, mentally pondering something, contemplating something, to think about something. So not just looking at something blankly, but when you look at something and you contemplate it, you think about it, that's called basar. That's called basar. So Allah is saying, return this sight, and return your contemplation, return your reflection, 
back to where you started from. Meaning first Allah told us, مَا تَرَفِي خَلْقِ Rahman. Look around in the creation of Allah, you won't find any inconsistencies. Now He's saying, now go back again. Commanding. Commanding. Go back again and apply your vision, apply your sight, apply your contemplation back again. Meaning do the same process again. هَلْ تَرَى مِنْ فُتُورِ Do you see مِنْ فُتُورِ Any type of futur basically means a gap to be in something. Futur means a gap. So do you find any type of a gap? Any type of a rip? Any type of a tear? A rip or a tear? A gap? Do you find any gaps? Meaning you don't find any, it's already established, you won't find any inconsistency. So you don't find any rips. The other thing about inconsistencies, this could be one thing with another being consistent. But just each individual item itself, there's no rip, there's no tear. Perfectly laid out. You won't find anything. Then the next ayah says what? Thumma. Thumma. Thumma in the Arabic language doesn't mean then, just then. We need to understand it properly. It, it implies like a, a passage of time. So then let some time pass. Or then some time has passed. Thumma arji al basar. Thumma arji al basar. Then return your reflection, your contemplation back again. Karratain. Karratain. Let me explain this word karra. Karra in the Arabic language is also used for like a military attack, a military strike. A military strike or a military attack. And what it refers to is when they make like strikes or they are making attacks and there's successive attacks that are all similar in force and in blow like one line after another line after another line consistent one after another attacks of the same kind over and over again that's called karra from this comes takrar to repeat something it doesn't just mean to repeat something it means to repeat something over and over again in the same manner to repeat something in the same way over and over and over again. That is what karra means. Now in the Arabic language, karratain, it means twice. But it doesn't literally mean twice. In any language, there are figures of speech, there are expressions. Like in English, if I say, there's dozens of books on my desk. That doesn't mean that there's literally 36 books exactly. Because I said dozens. That there has to be either 24 or 36 or 48 exactly. No, no, no. That just means there's lots of books on my desk. It's an expression. Similarly in Arabic, when you use something in the dual form, especially this word karratain, it means over and over again. It doesn't literally mean just twice. It means over and over and over and over again. Repeatedly. To repeatedly do something, but I told you this word implies not to just repeatedly do something, but make sure there's consistency in how you're doing it too. With the same quality, with the same force, to do it over and over again repeatedly. So Allah said, Thumma. So first in the previous ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, Farji al basar. Return back your gaze, your contemplation. Hal min futur, you didn't find any gaps? Well, guess what? Then after some time has passed, return back your gaze, your contemplation, your reflection, return it back again, karratain, over and over and over and over again, repeatedly. Make sure this is something you normally do. Make sure this is something you consistently do. You have a regular habit of doing this. That you keep looking back, you keep reminding yourself, you keep pondering. What will happen if you're consistent with this? If you regularly do this, what will be the result of it? Yan qalib. Now we always have the word raja. Raja means to return. In qalaba also means to return, but different. In qalaba means when something returns back or something turns in a different direction. But the direction has changed. Something has changed in the situation. So yan qalib means yan qalib ilayk al basar. Your contemplation. The vision, the contemplation, the reflection will return back to you, changed. Meaning if you are consistent, you are regular, you regularly look out there, you focus, you think, you contemplate, you reflect, your perspective will change. So it's giving us practical steps. You, meaning it's impossible for you to be open-minded, to be honest, sincere, truthful, look out there, ponder upon Allah's creation, think about it, reflect on life, and your perspective not to change. It can't happen. 
ينقلب إليك البصر. It will return back to you. Your perspective will change. خاسي أن خاسي أن خاسي أن In the Arabic language, the root of the word has a very strong meaning to it. It means to repel, like it's used. It was used in classical Arabic to talk about like shooing a dog away from you. Like if you're disgusted by a dog, you don't like a dog coming near you to shoo it away from you, to throw a rock at it and kind of chase the dog away from you, so not make it near come near you, to kick a rock in its direction. It's khasa. So khasi an means you your not your perspective will come back to you, return back to you, change khasi an in a stage where you are now humbled, humiliated, meaning it will have put you in your place. What? It, why, why are you shooing that dog away? Because you want that dog to know its place. It shouldn't come here near you. It should stay there. So you will you will now know your place khasi an wa huwa hasir. And he will be hasir. Hasir refers to somebody getting worn out, being fatigued, being tired, exhausted. And it specifically was used for getting tired, getting exhausted, getting fatigued of looking at something. If you sit there and you stare at something for a long time and then you get tired, now your head hurts and your eyes are sore and you're just exhausted, you're tired, that's called hasir, hasar. So that's what will happen. You will be tired, you'll be fatigued, and you'll be completely worn out, humiliated, humbled, and you'll know your place. So something very interesting here, and we'll end with this is, even the word usage. Allah uses the word raja'a. Raja'a. Raja'a means to return back something to its original place. So keep returning back to that reflection. And if you keep applying that reflection, that contemplation consistently, what will happen? Allah uses the word, yanqalib. Your perspective will change. Karratain, but you have to be reflecting with the same level of quality, the same level of consistency, and it will change your perspective. So, inshallah, let's go ahead and uh, stop here. Next week, inshallah, we'll continue on from here. Subhanallah, wa hamdihi, subhanakallahum, wa hamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.